You're listening to the Effective Statistician Podcast, the weekly podcast with Alexander Schacht and Benjamin Pieske. And yes, he is on the show today, designed to help you reach your potential, lead great science and serve patients without becoming overwhelmed by work. So in today's episode, you will learn a little bit about the background of why Benjamin was not long on this show for some time and why there was this break. But more importantly, you will learn about some really important trends in our industry and also how you can ride these waves for your benefit. As this show goes live, we are heading up to really really nice workshop that i am giving in mid of december 2023 in frankfurt this workshop is designed for leaders within our industry to shape their strategy to understand where they are now they and their organization and where they want to go and how they can reach that so if you want to really have a strategy and not just a series of buzzwords, but a coherent strategy of what are all the things you want to do, what are all the things you don't want to do, who do you want to serve, how do you want to serve, who do you want to hire, how do you want to hire, how do you delegate, what do you do internally, what do you outsource, what kind of services you buy in, how you can have a bigger impact, then this workshop is the right thing for you. Just reach out to me via email or get in contact with me via LinkedIn. That is the easiest way. You will find all the contact details in the show notes. I'm producing this podcast in association with PSI, a community dedicated to leading and promoting the use of statistics within the healthcare industry for the benefit of patients. Join PSI today to further develop your statistical capabilities with access to the video on demand content library, free registration to all PSI webinars and much, much more. Head over to psiweb.org to learn more about PSI activities and become a PSI member today. Welcome to another episode of the Effective Statistician. And after quite some time, this is with Benjamin again. Hi, Benjamin. How are you doing? Good. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, it's been amazingly long, right? And actually, we are we are hitting a very special day today. Isn't it your birthday? Yes, yes, yes. It's <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure. Like, you know, I mean, we haven't met for 50 years, but it's been, you know, Congratulations to a very round and, you know, half century birthday for you. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks so much. And all the best yeah. for the next 50 years. <laughs> exactly because yeah. of this, I thought about, you know, a topic that is a little bit looking into the future and looking backwards and, and looking into trends and uh, of what's happening. But just to give you a little bit also some background on why Benjamin hasn't been on the show for so long, because he was renovating an old house and moving into it. And well, that comes with a lot of logistics, a lot of work and a lot of yeah, following up with people it's uh yes and it's also like looking in the future because it's it's not nearly finished right so yeah. <laughs> i hope i don't spend the next two and a half years as we did with the you know until getting here with the same type of work so yes it's so you know i had a, my, my second job was rebuilding a house or organizing it yeah so i have a couple of trends that i think will have quite some impact on our day-to-day -day work was in development of new drugs and from a statistics point of view. And these, well, some, just some kind of more or less random things, of course, there's lots of lots of other things going around as well. But here I have some kind of case studies and I see more and more kind of direction in, in terms of that. And of course, the first one is large language models. So what kind of 
everybody is talking about AI with chat GPT and all these other things. I think that definitely will have an impact. I've just seen an announcement that Claire and Chat from PSI have their next lunch and learn also about this topic and how it will impact our workplace, how it is impacting our workplace already and how it will kind of change the future of how we work. How are things in terms of, you know, using it, for example, also for programming and things like this? How have you seen any kind of developments in, in terms of that? Yeah, I don't, I think professionally, you know, I haven't seen any impact on, you know, on my day-to-day -day work. I mean, there's, I mean, obviously I, I give it a try, right? So writing an email and just, you know, using ChatGTP and, and kind of getting like, you know, grouping information and nicely phrasing it, especially for me as a, you know, non-native English speaker, it is helpful in many ways to get like the formulations and phrasing of, of words and, and so these kind of things. So, but nevertheless, I think the potential is gigantic, right? So there's so much of, you know, it's so frightening and amazing at the same time and how, you know, these algorithms or these support functions are actually usable already for mm. the day-to-day -day life, right? I mean, I just see, you know, kids writing text for school or not writing text, but, you know, <laughs> getting the text written for school. And, and also I've seen examples. It's also not in, you know, more in the, in the private environment is in using programming languages and yes. translating from one language to another, which, so I was told was working excellently. So it was really amazing what frame of programming language was created by ChatGTP in this case, from, you know, either giving instructions of what needs to be done or using one language and translate it into another language. So that is amazing. But again, I'm, I'm not yeah. sure yet where we get there professionally. So I have seen, for example, around data visualization. Yeah, that that can help quite a lot if you want to improve data visualizations. That you can use, you know, AI to help with the programming of these kind of different things. Yeah, so I'm pretty sure I, that will have an impact. I believe. Uh, I mean, I just remember how you know how difficult it was to find you know do nice visualization or you know graphical environments in SaaS. So giving examples and just you know making it nicer by by just talking to JetGTP is will be probably extremely helpful. Yeah, I think the other area where it will definitely have an impact is analyzing unstructured data. Yeah, so if you just think about clinical literature, literature reviews systematic literature reviews, all these kind of different things, I think they will definitely have an impact. I've already seen companies using it to, for example, evaluate new indications for existing compounds or existing drugs, existing, you know, therapies, gene therapies, whatsoever. Yeah. So looking into what is in the literature available around all these kind of different things and then synthesizing it into a, a report that gives you also all the references in terms of which studies, which publications and so on help you to determine, okay, these are all the potential other indications you can look into. Yeah. And I yeah. think that is really, really interesting. It is probably absolute, uh, you know, absolutely helpful. I mean, it would save time and just the, you know, the structure and finding it. My, I'm wondering how reliable the information is or how bulletproof it is, let's say. Because I know that, you know, there, there have been examples in, you know, how you feed chat GTP with some information, which was right or wrong. And at the end, the same information is being spread to other people asking for the same. So, you know, you can feed actually incorrect information into chat GTP easily. And also that, that references are made to, you know, with, sound absolutely right, but non-existing papers. 
And so I think there is there's the chat GPTs, and then there's also the models that are trained within certain companies. Yeah, that mm-hmm. is, and that is my question. Where I'm going, so what what is kind of the? I mean, that, that will actually mean that this is something that companies need to invest a lot in, in yeah. order to get it out. I mean, also for, you know, for privacy reasons, right? So if you, you know, if you put in information and kind of trying to find a strategy and how to move forward with you, you know, with you, so that, uh, you know, there's some, yeah. <laughs> some sensibility yeah. on the data. Sometimes. And that is, so, so privacy is actually a very, very interesting topic because that clashes with yet another trend that I see, and that is transparency. I think the, we have already started with clinicaltrials.gov and, and these kind of things. There's a lot of move towards more transparency. And I'm just thinking about one specific case that is the, the, the trend that potentially we will have raw data being submitted or patient level data being submitted to the EU. And based on the EU regulations, Lots of this data will become public. Yeah. They said basically, you know, patient listings are already in in a sense public. And this is just a just a different format. Yeah. So I think that will there will be major shifts about this. I was recently at a SPI regulatory workshop in Basel where I saw some presentations and discussions about this, and I think this will have a tremendous effect on the overall industry if there's, if there's more transparency in terms of uh, clinical trial data. Yeah, but that is, I mean, collecting data and having data and then making it transparent, that is something that I can, that is easily, well, it's for me, I mean, I, I can understand how this is functioning and what benefit it has. And also what restrictions we could actually apply. So I think from where I see more, um, I wouldn't say danger, but more challenges is not only the the privacy of data, of you know personal data or patient data or what type of data, but what, what I'm seeing more is that then the the trends. I mean, you were describing something where you find. You know, where you see trying to f- gather information of uh, different either, you know, um, indications or treatments or and, and find. So that is actually creating uh, companies are having a strategy or planning for a strategy. Yeah. So and if you have competitors on the market and you use publicly available chat GTPs, let's say, to figure out your own trend or to find your own strategy that is actually information that would be very beneficial for your competitors yeah. so i'm i'm more talking about not the privacy of personal data or patient data but more about the the sharing and the spreading of information that you feed into systems that are publicly available yeah. and i think there's there's a big risk and that's why i think it's it's a good idea for big companies to actually create their own chat gtp like tools yep. Yep. and and have it but on the other hand this is restricted to big companies because small companies can't afford it yeah oh i don't know whether there you know will be services made available by small companies that say yep. hey you can have you know we host your large language model here and you you know mm. can just you know purchase a license to it and we ensure that you know all your models uh, data stays within your area. Yeah. So that is definitely will have a lot of impact overall on our work. And yeah, that's just amazing. Yeah. And th- but that is actually independent of our, you know, of pharma industry. So it is yeah, really it's, it's beyond the pharma it's industry, beyond definitely. Pharma yeah. industry. Yeah. There's another thing that also is a trend that is beyond the pharma industry, and that is virtual and augmented reality. A couple of years ago, I was already kind of talking about, wouldn't it be nice to have, you know, virtual screens that, you know, you can see much more kind of data and you can interact with more kind of different things. And at the time it was possible, but really, really expensive. 
And there were lots of kind of initial problems with it. And I think from that trend has definitely evolved more with, you know, meta having these different virtual reality things that you use for gaming and all kinds of different things. And there is now more and more applications coming for work environments so that you have, can have, you know, you're not restricted to just your physical screen that you have on your desk, but you can have many, many more interactions there. And I think that will become really interesting for working virtually together, but also, for example, interacting with data, you know, data visualizations, data displays, all these kind of different things. Yeah, I believe you're right. I'm not sure. I hope you're right. But I think the speed that I was expecting this to come is much slower. Mm -hmm. So from just thinking back, I don't know, when it was like the metaverse announced and the big hype assumed to be starting well, five years, maybe six years. I, I don't know. So it's it's a while ago. And since then, it is... Well, it's there's nothing. I mean, Apple brought up some other, you know, ways of, you know, virtual reality, and I, you know, I haven't really followed the trend, but to me, it didn't come through yet. I think there's lots of small iterations, but prices for virtual reality classes have it's... fallen quite a lot. Yeah. yeah. By the way, oh, I just got one for my as a birthday present. So. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. And. I've seen already kind of applications, yeah, yeah. Where, where people basically sit in the, you know, the living room and kind of have all the different things around. Yeah, I think what you mentioned about the data presentation of deep dive into data and looking into data, interactive, et cetera. So I think there's a potential indeed. So where, where you say, you know, sitting in your chair, armchair, and then just, you know, you know walking through the data. Yeah. So I think, no, I mean, th there's probably really potential, but I think until we get there, we first have to create this in terms of the data. So the availability of the data in that format or in the, in the way how to approach this. And I think most of the companies are still struggling in organizing and doing this in 2D data. <laughs> so so yeah. the visualization, uh, visualization is still like a big hassle even on a screen, on a single screen, yeah. and putting this in virtual reality and maybe, you know, in gestures and handling data. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. So that will be probably quite convenient, but I just now imagine like, you know, like a gathering of people waiting for the results and all sitting with virtual reality, 3D glasses in a meeting room in a company and you know, walking their fingers through the air, just gestures. <laughs> so it's it's kind of an interesting, it's an interesting imagination, but I think the potential is there, not only for gaming, but really for using this professionally. But I haven't yep. seen any things. For, for me, it's just imagination at the moment. I haven't seen any any of these, nor do I have glasses. I mean, yeah. I'm not yet 50, so maybe it's <laughs> <laughs> not yet. Yeah, there's, there's one other thing that I see is is more in terms of the contracting overall. Yeah, I think the, I've, I've seen now a couple of marketplaces that are specialized for clinical development and pharmaceutical area. Yeah, and they have a business model to help big companies work more easily with small companies. Which is an interesting trend, yeah, because you have, of course, on one side, you have lots of, you know, big pharma companies that need a lot of volume and work to get done. And on the other side, you have lots of small specialist companies. I see it especially also in, in the stats area. Yeah? There's so many freelancers, so many, you know, small companies that have maybe, you know, five people, 20 people, 30 people, 40 people, yeah, which don't have the critical mass that one of the big players on the farmer side says, yeah, they have enough volume, so it makes sense to, to organize a contract with them. But these marketplaces basically create 
master service agreements and all these kind of different things so that the big companies can easily work with the small vendors. And I've seen now a couple of these emerging. And I think this is this is an interesting trend that I haven't seen before so much. Yeah. Um will be interesting how that pl- pans out. Yeah. Whether that makes uh, it's it's just yet a completely different alternative to the way of working. Yeah. Because there's also a lot of regulations that permits this, this kind of outsourcing that, that people kind of fire companies fire their people and then they rehire them through a third party mm-hmm. just to kind of save costs i think there's there's some potential there as well yeah i don't i haven't seen it personally but i know it, it existed already for quite a while for individuals mm-hmm. so that that freelancer basically open their laptop in the morning, the Bahamas or anywhere they currently are, and uh, have an assignment, kind of a job to do. So not necessarily work the whole life or year or month with one task and company, but have through like a distribution or maybe these kind of companies that are between the ask and the, you know, and the give and have assignments in the, you know, changing or on an hourly or daily or whatever basis. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't know exactly what type of companies or what type of freelancer this was. I believe it's more on the marketing side. So in, so where they have been assignments, which are smaller not like for what we usually have, like, like a full study life or in compound cycle of developing. And so, which is more about years or even decades, depending on, yeah. Well, I've seen that also kind of for, especially on the high end side. Yeah. People that are very, very experienced and who choose to not work for one of the, you know, big, pharma companies or the big CROs that say, hey, I can, you know, sell my expertise more kind of individually and more granularity, yeah, and say, hey, you want to have a discussion about your safety strategy and you can book, don't know, 30 hours with me and because I'm one of the experts on safety statistics, Mm -hmm. yeah, and so you can have this kind of work with me. And that's kind of then through this overall master service agreement, very, very easy to do. Yeah. I think it is something beneficial. I would say it's not applicable for all people, obviously. Definitely not for all I, people. Yeah. First of all, flexibility, the uncertainty is kind of, you know, that, that people may not, I mean, may not, you know, value. I mean, uncertainty, I may not, you know, live with. And also what I think is that at you know, sometimes people do need to invest more into or like kind of identify themselves with their yeah. what, what they're doing, which is fine sometimes that you have a short period of, of involvement in, in certain mm-hmm. things, but then it should be maybe always the same company that you either work for or work with so that, that you kind of identify not only that, oh, that's my task. And then, you know, after 30 hours, I'm going home or I'm just finishing it and then I'm off and I don't care. But it's more about the identification with the with the role. But yes, I think it's a, it is a trend. And it's also, especially with the with the cost savings that are, you know, and and slimming down the the whole structure and, and infrastructure department, HR, supportive departments, et cetera. So that is probably trend that might ex- I, I don't know I you know I haven't I don't have any experience there but I think this is I can imagine it has a future yeah so and I completely agree it will not be applicable to everybody yeah I think it's just another way of working yeah yeah and for it gives an edge to small companies to better compete with with the big ones yeah, yeah. for these big clients. Another of pretty 
clear kind of trend is everything about open source programming. Oh yeah. yeah? Well, I think that, that's not a new trend. That, that's not a new trend. <laughs> it's just kind of accelerating more and more, and more and more companies are going into this. I recently even talked to um, someone from SaaS who, who mentioned, "Hey, by the way, you can also, in, you know, in." use R within the SaaS environment and there's interfaces for that and there's validated R library within SaaS and all these kind of different things. So even SaaS has kind of seen that, well, they can't kind of just do without it anymore. Yeah, it, you know, it's again, I'm not, you know, I'm not programming anymore. Unfortunately, in some way, I'm, I do miss this. It was really like one of the, my deep work experiences in programming rather. <laughs> but the... What I see there is that it's absolutely true because the variety and the variability and the the offer that you have on the open source market is the wrong word, but it's kind of, you know, the, the platforms, so whatever is available, that's gigantic. So it's really nice because everyone is implementing it, they use it is and reuse it. The downside, especially in our industry, is that it is open source, right? Meaning that that more or less everyone has access and you, you you know if you and things are evolving and changing and whatever you validate and whatever you use may be outdated and there's there's depending on what you're using i mean there are also mm. you know offers or or packages that that are validated or that are controlled but that again is then a little bit trending away from the open source type of thing even though it is open source it is not has doesn't have the flexibility and the and the authorship i mean the the input you get from from the different from the different you know programmers that are actually improving adding parts to to open source software so there's it it always sounds very good more like a buzzword now saying open source mm -hmm. programming because if it's open source, it's not usable for us. If it's not open source, or if it's usable for us, it may it may be the source may be open source, but at the end, it's a little bit more restricted. Yeah, so I think the it it comes together with more and more collaboration. Yes, I think that's a, that's a piece, and there's the big there's a lot of big pharma companies, and especially of course Roche. Uh, we talked about this quite a lot, but many others like AZ, GSK invest a lot in this area and there's more and more kind of platforms for collaboration there for automation standardization so i think if you are mostly working with kind of creating standard tables a predicted job will be will be get done by using open source and a lot of more mm. automation in the future also, Cytel is now involved there, so they're they're cooperating with other you know pharma companies on this. So this is it is it is right, but at the end, you know, then then we need to kind of define exactly what the open source means because if you yeah, put yeah. this in yeah. the packages and cooperation, it is not open source anymore in the in the classical sense. It is yeah. then on a valid. So that's why I'm. I think what it really is and what the future is, because this this is now a trend for the last ten years. So it's not really like an. More, no, it's not a complete. It's new not. Trend. A, it's it not is, a new yeah. trend. But I think what the benefit is, and we we don't know. I mean, we are talking R at the moment primarily, but who knows, right? Let's gather again in five years and let's see what a Python or. Anything else is the trend now. But I think what the benefit is and why why this is changing, and since you mentioned SaaS, is that the flexibility in and the uh, creativity that we see in the programs and in the development of the of the of the language and the programs is setting the directions. Mm. So the industry is following open source. So and I think that is that is the thrilling piece of it because there, it's not that we develop something or, or SaaS is developing and then together in cooperation with what what is needed. No, you know the 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 trend is that it's out there already and somebody detects it and uses it and thinks oh it's a good idea. So and so I think the 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 variability and the flexibility is increasing and we need, just need to kind of fence it into you know our environment our regulated environment more or less. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, so definitely this new trend 
creates completely new questions. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely, absolutely. The last trend I want to speak about is the increase in terms of payer involvement and the, the importance of payer. And of course, that is also not a new trend. Yeah, so the power of payers, of insurance companies, of national policy makers have definitely increased over, over the years. Now with the new EU HTA regulations coming into play in start of 2025 for the oncology area, this will have a huge impact overall on the industry. And the, if you have an, if you're working in phase two and phase three and you think, well, I don't need to know about this. Sorry, you're wrong <laughs> because we will see a lot more parallel efforts going on both for the EU submission and the EU payer involvement. And that will definitely have an impact on how we work when, you know, how we work together. We will need, you know, we can't just, you know, first, oh, let's take care of the regulatory submission. And once we have figured that out, we, we think about all the payer questions. No, things need to go in parallel. And that will require organizations to have different procedures, to have different processes, to have potentially different capabilities. I'm just thinking in terms of indirect comparisons, network meta-analysis, these kind of different things. But it will definitely need to speak for better understanding of the overall process and more collaboration across the different, I think, very often siloed functions. Yeah. And that is both, you know, the development people need to more embrace what's happening on, on the other side and the HTA and marketing and salespeople need to more embrace on what's happening on the regulatory side. Yeah. There will be definitely much more interactions in that regard. Yeah, I think that is, that is a trend in general. Well, what we see is that the involvement you know, that you moving away from this, you know, the siloed responsibilities. So you mm. think, oh, let's develop this. And then, you know, then next phase or next. So we already started this in the developing of the phases, but actually with the peer involvement, I think there's generally a trend of planning a drug, not only until submission, but beyond. So yeah. anything that's, you know, that's coming next and to already involve i mean in in the past or most of the times probably even today it's different groups different departments that are working in on the different phases and this itself is like a it's an in, you know it's not a correct construction of the of the of the company well not correct but it's at least there are downsides to it what you just described is the involvement of you know the the, the respective people payer in this case early on is important but how do you manage this in you know if you have siloed worst case siloed groups i think this is the the people that don't or the companies that don't embrace this trend will suffer from it yeah, yeah. if your clinical development organization is just you know measured based on time to regulatory approval and all these other regulatory timelines well bad for you yeah because you will get something on the market that nobody will be able to use yeah, yeah. or there where payers and by the way not just the european payers will say no we don't yeah. pay for and, that <laughs> and there's i mean it's just you know it's time consuming to actually correct this yeah, yeah. expensive right but it's, it's time consuming it's, expensive and yeah so at the end you you manage but whatever you save in the beginning by investing a lot lot more money and in, in getting the, the regulatory approval you know you spend double the money than just redoing everything yeah. in order to get the payer certified imagine you run a big phase three study that costs a couple of mil hundreds of million of euros and then you see well you haven't included certain variables like quality of life or whatever that the payers are interested in. Mm. Well, how do you get the data? Yeah? <laughs> you can't kind of travel back in time and ask patients, oh, by the way, how was your quality of life at baseline? Yeah? Stop. Yeah? 
and this is nearly impossible to 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 correct again yeah so these kind of failures will be really really costly and damaging to organizations mm. and i think some organizations will just learn it the hard way yeah yeah unfortunately but i mean this isn't anything i mean again it's not a trend for the future it's a trend that we've already seen that there are, and uh, learned a lot i mean we it's always bits and bits because we you know we learned it first of you know in in starting a phase one or even before and already thinking about phase three right so that is that is something that the you know the industry learned a while ago but now it's beyond that it's not only regulatory submission it is yep yeah. so and in summary for you That means you can, of course, ignore these, but as for companies, it's not helpful to ignore these. I think it's much more good to at least embrace them, get to know about these, and potentially even build your career strategy on it. Yeah, See how you can lead certain curves here can you become an expert in this area can you spearhead kind of raising awareness within your company around around these things make you more kind of be seen yeah recently i had guillaume on the podcast where we talked about within az and he has driven that forward quite a lot and benefited personally from spearheading this initiative. So have a look into this. How can you potentially ride one of these waves and with that really benefit and have an impact on your career? Thanks so much, Benjamin. That was another awesome discussion and I'm really looking forward for future ones. Yeah, be more frequent your, your house. <laughs> forward. My my trend is more frequent episodes with you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> bye bye. Don't forget about the strategy workshop in Frankfurt on 12th, 13th and 14th of December 2023. If you are interested, just give me a shout and we can see whether there's still place available for you. This show was created in association with PSI. Thanks to Rain and her team at VVS who helped with the show in the background. And thank you for listening. Reach your potential, lead great science and serve patients. Just be an effective statistician.